1679, the French explorer La Salle <laughs> set out from Montreal in search of the mouth of the Mississippi River. Enduring many hardships, in 1682, La Salle reached the Gulf of Mexico, claiming the land he'd explored for king and country. In celebration of the American Bicentennial in 1976, 23 Elgin area men, led by Larkin High School French teacher Reed Lewis, set off from Montreal in canoes with the goal of educating the public on French history in North America. Some of them have reunited here today to reflect on the experience in this program made possible by an Illinois Humanities Activate History Grant. Now live, the Elgin Public Museum of Natural History and Anthropology in Lords Park presents La Salle Expedition 2, re-explored at 45. Hi everyone, my name is Andrew and I'll be moderating this program for La Salle Expedition 2, re-explored at 45. Before we get into this, I do just want to outline a little bit of the program and how you guys will be able to ask questions. So, since we're on YouTube, we will have the live chat enabled and we will be talking, we will be able to to see your, your questions as you ask them. So if you have a question at any point in time, please type it into the chat and we'll try to answer as many questions as we will be able to. Um, we also have this program broken up into two parts. We have, the first part is gonna be talking about LaSalle, and the man himself, you know, background and what he was doing in America, the expedition, his relationship with Native Americans. Then we'll have a dedicated question and answer portion, which again, if you have any question at any point, please feel free to ask it in the, in the chat. Then the second part is going to be on the LaSalle 2 expedition, where we talk about your guys' experience, where we talk about the, the liaison team, and where we talk about you know environmental changes and all that. So here with me today in person, I have Reed and Ken Lewis, I have Rich Gross, I have Chuck Campbell, and Kathy Poehler, and Sam Hess. And joining us via Zoom, we have Bob Kulik and Mark Lieberman. How's everyone doing today? Thank you guys also so much for coming in. I know some of you drove a little farther than others. I know Chuck, you came in from Minnesota. No, Kathy, you came in from like Georgia. UP, yeah. <laughs> so how's everyone doing today? Great. Good. Good. Doing for well, us. thank you. Yeah, well, I'm glad you guys are all able to make it here and join us through Zoom. So, we're just, since we have a lot to cover, we're just going to jump right on in to the program here. So, starting with the background on who was LaSalle. Now, at least when I was in school, we didn't really talk much about LaSalle at all when I was in high school. You know, even though we have the LaSalle County here in Illinois, we have the LaSalle Street in Chicago, we have a LaSalle State Bank, and there's a LaSalle Parish down in Louisiana. But I don't know much, we don't know much about it, and we don't really talk about it. So who really, who was LaSalle, and like, you know, why was, why was he here in America to begin with? Kind of my first question. There's a LaSalle Street in Elgin, too. I didn't know there was a LaSalle Street. Sure, on the west side, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, you want to answer that there, Mr. LaSalle? No, you're the... Who was LaSalle? He was, uh, he was a Frenchman who, who had spent uh, most of his young life in the Jesuit order in Paris and with the plans of becoming a Jesuit priest, but uh, for some reason decided to leave that, uh, that group. And, um, and he wound up in Quebec. Uh, LaSalle had many connections here in North America. His uncle was a member of the 100 Associates who actually owned the rights to, to govern and to uh, the business venture at, uh, in New France. It was a it's like a company town. Uh, it didn't become a royal um, colony until 1663 when it was retroceded back to the king. So LaSalle came here, I think, looking for opportunity. Uh, he was no longer a Jesuit priest. He had family in, in, in Quebec and in Montreal. His brother was a, was a Sulpician priest, and he was living at, uh, at Montreal where there was a Sulpician seminary. And, uh, and he came to North America. No one can answer the question, why did LaSalle leave? the Jesuit order, or why did he come here? I think the simple explanation is he's looking for opportunity. Mm -hmm. like, many, like many people came. Yeah, but the unique thing about LaSalle is he was one of the most educated people in North America at that time, having been 
part of the Jesuit order, gone through their university and was actually a university teacher for several years before he got here. Uh, he was a, a, a literate man and, a, and an educated man. So he was unique in that for sure. Rich, why then did he elect to, to bring a Franciscan on the expedition? Hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> At the time uh, of the retrocession, when the king finally took control of, of New France, it had been run by the Jesuits uh, almost from the, from the beginning. And it was really a, uh, a, a Jesuit stronghold. It was a theocracy. The Jesuits ran the government, and they ruled uh, with Jesuit <coughs> determination. And the king, uh, Louis XIV, was one of the first strong monarchs in France. He became the head of the church in France, which was not common in Europe, because the head of the church, of course, was the pope. Mm -hmm. Well, the king, a Gallican king, that is the king who had control of the, of the religion, um, wanted to also gain control of religion in the New World. But he knew he couldn't just wrestle this for the Jesuits. There'd be a big, big upheaval. So to dilute the Jesuit influence in North America, he encouraged the importation of priests from other orders, even secular priests without an order. So LaSalle um, was the man who brought actually five, they came, came to North America with LaSalle, five recollect priests. And that was Louis XIV's uh, determination to dilute the, uh, the authority of the Jesuits in North America. So that's why the reckless. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. so. Good answer. Yeah, so then, but while he was here, he was uh, obviously, you know, he was involved a little bit with the church, not with Jesuits, but he was also talking with like Native American groups, right? He was very involved with the Native Americans. When he first came to, to Canada, uh, he went right to Montreal, and where his brother was a Sulpician priest, and, and Montreal was at that time actually owned by the Sulpician order. Uh, it was a seniory that was given to them. And um, then he got a grant of what's now known as Lachine, which was, uh, it was a, a settlement that was actually started by Champlain. It goes all the way back to the early 1600s. LaSalle gained control of that and decided to create a settlement there. So um, he busy, was busy uh, for the first two years of his life uh, working to build a, a settlement at the northern, uh, I mean, guess it's the southern end of the island of Montreal. It is now known as Lachine. And, and through his work there, he, he met many Iroquois natives and um, began to learn their language and listen to the stories of what lay beyond Lake Ontario. And, that, and that's interesting because the Iroquois were hostile to the French at this time. Well, the Iroquois had, had actually um, been at war with the French until 1665. Uh, Sir de Tracy came over as the general who, who actually was able to establish peace with the Iroquois through war. And at that time, the Iroquois were at peace with, with the French. Jesuits were in the, uh, in the settlements, the Iroquois settlements, uh, trying to bring the word of God to them, at least as Europeans knew it. And uh, LaSalle was at, at uh, Montreal, uh, at Lachine, and he was uh, interacting with these people on a daily basis. So he got to know them first at, through his work at the settlement of Lachine. Yeah, and that would come in handy later when he encountered different it would come in handy later in 1669. LaSalle didn't arrive in, in, uh, uh, in Canada until 1667. Uh, he spent a year and a half establishing a settlement at, at Lachine, but then he sold it back. The improvements were sold back to the Sulpician Order because he wanted to go on an expedition. He wanted to go and explore uh, what the Iroquois had told him was the Ohio River, which, uh, which he hoped would lead uh, to the South Sea, or the Vermilion Sea, they called it, which is the Sea of California. Um, during France's entire occupation of North America at that point, they were always looking through for a Northwest Passage, some quick way to get a trade route to China. So uh, even in LaSalle's time, they were looking for that passage to China. So he, had, through the stories he heard from the Iroquois, he uh, hoped that the Ohio River would take him to China. So he did an expedition in 1669 and made it as far as Pittsburgh on the Ohio River before returning. So that was his first foray into the wilderness. And, and then he spent the next three years amongst the Iroquois, trading with them and traveling with them. During that time, he learned their language, he learned their customs, which is most important. Uh, how to interact with the Indians, how to make deals with the Indians, how to work with them. So, so those three or four years were invaluable to LaSalle's future because 
He really got to know the, the natives and he worked with them. They were his trade partners, they were his allies. It was important for him always to establish good relations with the native people. Now that also leads me to another question. You know, since he was here, he was establishing trade, you know, but what and, and gaining information for, you know, voyages and expeditions uh -huh. down, not just the Mississippi, but as you said, the Ohio. What were his motives? Well, obviously, you know, getting to China, but there's got to be more to that. You know, if you find China for France, you know, what do you get out of it? You know, well, what, yeah. what were his, like, motives for... Interestingly enough, uh, when he left the Jesuit order, if he wanted to be stationed in China, he fought and fought and fought and wanted that, but they wouldn't send him because he hadn't been through uh, his uh, uh, full training yet. So he left the order. When he came to North America, I don't think that was driving him. I think just the opportunity to be here was driving him. But then he heard this magical story about China, which intrigued him to take his first expedition in 69. Spent the next three or four years working with the Iroquois, but many things were happening in North America at that time. Governor Frontenac came uh, in 1673, and uh, he established a post, a fort, Fort Frontenac at Kingston. Do you remember Kingston? Mm -hmm. So we, at Kingston is where Fort Frontenac was, and LaSalle um, was made the commandant of that post. His cousin was here in, in uh, Canada, and his cousin had trading uh, uh, businesses in Montreal and at Quebec, and um, he was able to secure the, the uh, trade concession at, at Fort Frontenac. So his cousin ran the trade, but LaSalle was the commandant of the fort. So his, his goals, his aspirations were changing. Things, opportunity took him into different directions. In 1675, uh, he went back to France and um, asked the king, uh, to, to obtain Fort Frontenac as a seigneury. A seigneury meant that he would own the property, he would have to reimburse them for the construction of the post, but he would own and operate that, uh, and, and the king agreed. But here's one thing that's been missed in all of LaSalle's history. When he went back in 1675 and gained Fort Frontenac as a seigneury, uh, the king made him the governor of Fort Frontenac. And people have misconstrued what that means. In actuality, what it was, was it was an office, much like the office of governor of Montreal, the governor of Three Rivers, the governor at Quebec. He was the governor at Fort Frontenac. He was a colonial administrator, and he was very involved in, in all the, the political uh, intrigue in Canada at that time. From that time forward, he was an agent of the king, and that's been missed, and that's really important because that speaks to what happened several years later. 1670 to 1675, he became the, the governor and the commandant. He was actually a military man at that point. He oversaw all operations at the fort. He had to pay for, and he had to supply the garrison with all their arms and all their other munitions. So he was in charge of all of that. It's, and, but everybody who's looked at this history up till now has looked at it as though what was going on in, in, in Canada was almost in a vacuum, because Canada was separate from the rest of the world. But in reality, that's not true. Uh, what was happening in Canada was a function of what Minister Colbert wanted to happen, his plan throughout the whole world. Colbert uh, became the finance minister and also the minister of marine. So he was in charge of the Navy, in charge of finance. Colbert had a, had a, a mantra, he had, a, he had an attitude, and that was that um, um, e the economy um, of France had to be improved. And how would he improve the, the, the economy? By trade. At that time, they thought there was only two ways to increase the, the wealth of a country. This is the mercantilism a concept. One was you increase trade, and you bring precious metals into the country and become a wealthy country. The other is you go to war, and you take those precious metals. So uh, being the, the only two options that were at, at hand at that time, uh, LaSalle played in Colbert's uh, plans to improve the wealth and the financial situation in France. So in 1676, uh, I'm sorry, 1675 is one word of the Mississippi River's di discovery and exploration reached Colbert's desk. It wasn't until 1675. Joliet had done the exploration in 1673, but the reports didn't make it back to France until January 1675. Big time lag. At that point, Colbert was deeply involved in trying to expand the, the uh, economic wealth of, of uh, France and up to his neck in the Dutch War. The Dutch War involved was a land war in Europe, but it was a naval war throughout the rest of the world, particularly the Caribbean. 
where much of the, of, of the um, uh, economic wealth was coming, was imported from the Caribbean and from Africa. And uh, the Dutch were the ones that, that owned the largest navy at the time. They were the middlemen. They were bringing the, all these, these resources and making tons and tons of money. Colbert said, I'm taking it. She built the biggest navy in the world and destroyed the Dutch fleet between 1675 and 1677 in the Caribbean. How does this impact what's going on with LaSalle? That's, that's the thing. Um, Colbert had a much bigger plan than the Caribbean. He had a much bigger plan than Canada. And he merged the two, uh, his two goals. First was to, uh, to be able to keep his navy in, in the Caribbean. Um, he needed to have food for those people because in the islands it was all cash crop. They didn't even grow enough crops to sustain themselves or the slaves that they imported. They actually were importing beef from Ireland to, to feed the slaves. There was no food crops down there at all. So when the Navy got there, how do you revittle the ships? It's impossible. So what do you do when the men are sick? There's nowhere to, for hospitals for them. How do you repair the ships? There are no ports down there to, 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 to handle repairs of ships. That was a primary concern of Colbert's. The other concern was, um, was attacking Spanish wealth. Uh, the, he, he ridded the, himself of the, of the Dutch in, in the Caribbean. He wanted to move into the Gulf of Mexico and start attacking the Spanish silver mines and silver, uh, silver ships that were heading back uh, to, to Spain. But in order to do that, he needed some stronghold in the New World, and that's where LaSalle came in. Right at the time when they vanquished the Dutch Navy, uh, LaSalle, or, uh, Colbert had gotten a report from the commissary in the Caribbean saying that he needed some port to, to maintain his ships. At the very same time, there was a proposal where a Spanish renegade um, uh, former governor, Peñalosa, would, uh, would lead an expedition down the newly discovered Mississippi River, establish a post, and from there, they could attack Spanish silver mines. Well, Colbert took these, these two proposals. One was for a, a, somewhere to have a port to, to take care of his navy, and this wild scheme of Penulosas to establish a, a um, uh, post on the Mississippi River. And when Les, he had them together, and when, when Sal came and said, I want to build a, sh uh, a port at Niagara to keep the English out, and a port at the south end of Lake Michigan uh, so that I can capture the furs that are heading to England, um, uh, if you'll give me permission to do that, I'll, I'll do this in 20 years and we'll get in control of the Great Lakes. Colbert, in that instance, saw everything he needed to make his plan work. The plan was to have LaSalle establish his two posts on the Great Lakes, but continue down the Mississippi River, establish, establish a post there where he could maintain his navy and then attack the Spanish. And this is the story that we didn't know. This is a story that, that I've been working on this for 10 years now, trying to decide why was LaSalle there? Figure out why was LaSalle doing this? So the story is, is really a geopolitical uh, entry. Uh, what was Colbert's plan? And LaSalle was really nothing more than one cog in Colbert's very big wheel of and the they, economic game. It, and when did Colbert get his uh, television show? <laughs> <laughs> he is, he's on a late night, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Must be related. So that's what that's the that's the foreground. That's the history that we none of us knew this history. We were all told that LaSalle was an entrepreneur. He came here and he was a fur trader and he wanted to gain the the uh, economic strangle uh, strangle of the fur trade in the heart of the country. I mean, that's not exactly. It's not wrong. close to true. It's not close to true. <laughs> LaSalle was given the monopoly on bison mm -hmm. hides and things that, that people don't realize. Well, they always thought he was looking for for beaver furs. When you get to Illinois, the beaver aren't very good furs because it's not as cold here as it is to the north. You get to southern Illinois, the beaver furs are even, even uh, uh, less quality. You get down to Arkansas, where they have, where they have alligators, and there are no beaver. Mm -hmm. So was LaSalle really looking for beaver hides? He was looking for bison hides. He had a monopoly on bison hides. At the time, they were exporting 400,000 livres per year of beaver out of Canada. LaSalle figured he could export 2.5 million livres worth of bison out of the heart of the continent if he was able to establish his post at the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a financial, there was a financial gain here, but Colbert saw this as a very big gain for, for France. So all those resources would eventually make their way back to France, and since New France was part of France, the wealth of France would be increased.
Which does, that's actually a good segue into our next topic, and you can actually hit most of the... Do they get your online? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, because going down to Mississippi, as you said, Marquette and Joliet already figured out by this time that the Mississippi ran into the Gulf. To the Gulf. There's... But they, they stopped know. short. Yeah, but they, they did stop short. That's what I was going to yeah, They stopped at the mouth of the Arkansas River, and one of Colbert's biggest concerns was, where exactly does this river go, and is it navigable? Can I get my ships up the river? Especially the big naval vessels. Mm -hmm. And also, this is uh, Louisiana is firmly in the Spanish sphere of, of influence at this time. At that time, Spain, cl Spain claimed it. So yes. it's, uh, it's already very dangerous for you to be heading there. But right. then what was the, like, you know, what, what was there, like, any opposition to this? Obviously, if Spain knew, if Spain knew, they would have been like, no, dude, you can't go here. That's but, why the wording in his commission, his uh, letters patent of 1678 are so, are so um, general. They don't give any hint that he's going to the mouth of the Mississippi River, but a year later, the king wrote a memoir or, or a letter to the governor explaining that LaSalle is going to the mouth of the Mississippi River. The king knew that was the objective. It wasn't stated as commission because it would have been suicide to, to, to announce that he's going to the Gulf of Mexico. Spain would have been there waiting for him. At that time, Spain considered the Gulf of Mexico uh, their territory. It was like it was like their sea. No one, they wouldn't allow any French vessels to land at any ports in on the Spanish Main. Uh, they protected it with a vengeance. As a matter of fact, any settlement that was that was uh, established by the French, they would have killed everyone. No one would have survived. That was just simply Spain's policy. They, they, they would murder everyone. Which they tried to do. At well, the Indians Gordon, beat them to it in Matagorda yeah, Bay, yeah. right? <laughs> but, um, you know, so I was more like wondering, like, what internally were, was there like a uh, opposition to this? From, like, the opposition the to LaSalle, yeah, the opposition to LaSalle faced where it was, number one, from the merchants. Remember, his cousin had the, had the concession of fur trade at, uh, at Lachine until LaSalle came back. And when he owned that, he gained the concession himself. That's when he made his, his cousin his most bitter enemy. And his cousin allied with several merchants in Montreal and Quebec and tried to fight everything LaSalle did, tried, tried to make sure that he didn't succeed in any way. The Jesuits, who had operated a theocracy until the king took over, um, had all their own missions, Indian missions, inland. And they wanted to prevent any incursions from the authority, the French authority, into the wilderness that could corrupt their, their creation of a Christian utopia for the Indians. They had, they, had, they had tried this in Paraguay, and they were trying to do it in North America, create a, a, a Christian utopia. Of course, this is a Jesuit perception of what a, Jesu a, a, a Christian utopia would be. There's no way to equate the Jesuits at that time with the Jesuits of today. They're a completely different order. Uh, they have different goals. They have different objectives. And at that time, those people were missionaries, and they simply were trying to evangelize the Indians. And they wanted to keep LaSalle out. So they fought him. They actually started a war. They, they uh, tried to have him killed, and uh, they encouraged his men to desert at every turn. So he faced real opposition. And it wasn't, it's been said that LaSalle saw uh, you know, an en enemy behind every tree. And the reason that is, is he really did see enemies behind trees. They were there, and they were working against him. And ultimately, they prevented him from failing, and uh, that was the, the ultimate, his ultimate uh, demise was a result of all the opposition he faced in, in uh, Canada at that time. I think, I think there, the other resistance that wasn't mentioned would be from the indigenous people along the way. Um, yes, he had relationships with them and he understood languages and tried to understand cultures, but um, he was coming in and still trying to control that, that he was an air a, 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 yeah. area of the country right. um, uh, at the time. And so I think there was resistance uh, both, both to the visitors of La Salle and also to the uh, uh, Jesuits coming in, right? Because they were changing their culture, their lifestyle, right? And, and, and to change their lifestyle, the Indians lived the religion. Uh, everything they did revolved around their customs and their religion. Mm -hmm. And of course, when the Jesuits wanted to to eliminate the religion, it was their lifestyle. It was their entire culture was, was it at risk with that. And many of them resisted that. Uh, they did resist. Uh, they had allies. They had allegiances with other with other tribes, and there were tribes in the in the, in the heart of the continent that were allied with the with the Iroquois. 
if you were an ally of the Iroquois and the Iroquois were fighting the French, it didn't, didn't matter who you were, they were going to fight you. So yes, there were, there were alliances all over the place, and, and the French were trying to navigate their way through these native alliances, and it was a tricky task. That actually is a good, I think, a good segue into his relationship with Native Americans. Because if you, if you read his, the accounts of his expedition, or the various other accounts written about the expedition from other people who were there at the time, you know, he's always, you know, there's some crazy stories like, you know, like Tonti getting stabbed in the chest and then being healed. That was an Iroquois battle, mm -hmm. no, right. But then there's like him interacting with groups in, in the South that he had no, he had no first-hand knowledge of because, you know, one, it's not a group that he would regularly contact because it's within the Spanish sphere of influence, like, like uh, the Natchez, for example. So then how did La Salle just view like some of the southern tribes, you know, but like how did he view and interact with Native Americans just in general? Because as we said, he was an ad he was a pretty good diplomat, as he spent a lot of time among the Iroquois. He was obviously a trader, as he was able to trade for beaver fur and, and bison hide. But then how but how did he view these these different groups? They were allies. He wanted them to be allies. He could accomplish what he wanted to accomplish without the help of the Indians. He wanted to make them allies and friends, and and um, and he did everything in his power to to form allegiances everywhere he went. But as as Chuck pointed out, he still he still saw a lot of resistance because the Iroquois were convinced uh, by the Jesuits uh, that that uh, they should attack uh, the Illinois Indians, where LaSalle had set up at Crev Cur to uh, to build a vessel. LaSalle's plan was to build a vessel on the Illinois River sail it to the mouth of the Mississippi River, carrying tradesmen and tools, build his post, sail that ship out to the Gulf of Mexico, find out where the, where the mouth of the river was, and head back to France for reinforcements. His plans were foiled because the Jesuits had encouraged, initiated a war between the Iroquois and the Illinois, which destroyed his, his post. Uh, he lost his tools. Uh, Tonti was stabbed in, in, in part of the melee, almost died. Uh, so he... he he couldn't, um, he couldn't overcome the resistance of the Iroquois because of the intrigues of the, Jer of, of the Jesuits. But when he went to Illinois, he made allies of the Illinois Indians. He met natives that had come up the river, and he already had contacts with natives from the lower part of the river before he went there. He'd already, he'd already established friendly relations with many of those people. When he got down there, he, he was successful going down all the way to the mouth of the Arkansas River, uh, where the Arkansas, the, the uh, Quapaw Indians are, and uh, he made allies of them. And he actually had a process for ball there. The Quapaw Indians agreed to be his allies, and he made a process for ball, which is a written contract that explained that the Quapaw were now part of France. So that far south, he was very successful. South of there, in the southern portion of the Mississippi at that time, um, he, he began to encounter uh, influences from the English traders from North, from South Carolina, believe it or not. The Carolina traders had already made incursions way up over the Appalachians, deep into the, into the heart of the continent, and they were actually allied with natives on, on the Mississippi River. And, the, and what they were interested in was not furs, it was human lives. They were interested in slave trade. So the English were operating quite a productive slave trade on the lower Mississippi River, getting Native Americans to go and capture other tribes, bring them back to, to New England. So when La Salle got there, all the natives saw were these foreigners, they're dressed in European clothes, we're going to attack you. Because their, their villages had been decimated by this slave trade. So there were other influences there. And of course, La Salle didn't speak their languages, so there's no way to trade with them, there's no way to treat with them. All they knew that they, is that, that, that these people were enemies, and they fought them. And he had a heated battle with the Quintessipo on his way up the, the Mississippi River. Uh, they, were, they were in a camp. And they were attacked right at dawn. And uh, fortunately, none of the Frenchmen were killed on the expedition, but several of the natives were at that point. So they, and they were in danger all the way up to the mouth of the Arkansas River because those lower Mississippi River uh, natives uh, were all allies. And at that point, LaSalle became their enemy. So it wasn't all roses. It wasn't all, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't all a, a, a success all the way down. But LaSalle uh, was able to make enough alliances and, and uh, make enough friends to where he felt that he could establish his post down there eventually. And it probably didn't help with the Spanish relations with 
the Native Americans down there? No, they were at war with Spain. The, the, all the natives were. Uh, Ken. Is, is there any truth to the rumor that uh, a large, a large part of the reason for the popularity of La Chine as the embarkation point for the expedition had to do with the popularity of Ed Fu Young among the uh, <laughs> among the voyage. It never changed. It's been like this for 40 years. It hasn't changed a bit. It could be, Ken. I'll look into that. Okay. Ed Fu Young. <laughs> Sam and I spent, spent uh, nine months with these two guys in our canoes, and the stories, that we, we can't tell any of them, not one of them, but the stories that, right Bob? <laughs> the stories that would go back and forth between these guys in the canoes entertained us for nine months. I should point out that La Chine, in English, means China. Yes. It means China. And the reason why it got its name is because they were looking for the passage to China, and they thought that, that the, 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 uh, the river system and the lake system from there would lead them there, and exactly. that's where it got its name from. Right. Exactly. Long before LaSalle got there. Because they already actually had found a way to get there. It was a really long way. If you go, because Magellan had already made Oh, he circumnavigated. So, yeah, but it was also in Spanish and Portuguese control, and you, don't, you can't exactly. Right. They were, looking for, they were looking for that way through North America because they, they didn't have to contend with other European nations. Right. And there was a ready supply of egg fouillon. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you want? You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Something else. Is, yeah. Something else that I find interesting is like, I didn't know that he was already in touch with groups way <laughs> south, far south before he was already, before he went on this expedition. But, where do we get this information from? Because there is uh, still some, there are some writings, there are some Spanish expeditions along the coast, and some other travels. I don't remember. It was, uh, information about what? About the Native Americans. And he knew most, almost nothing about the people down there. He had met individuals from different tribes who visited him mm -hmm. when he was in Illinois, and uh, he knew about them, and, and uh, he was able to, you know, uh, actually. Uh, he had some problems in Illinois with, with the Indians and, and, and trying to, to, to establish a, a good working relationship with them. And one day, uh, one young native had come uh, from, a, uh, from the south, from an expedition he was on, and he ran into LaSalle, and LaSalle befriended him, and gave him some trade goods, and the young man actually drew LaSalle a map of the Mississippi River and told him all about the lower Mississippi River. So he had inklings about what it was, and he knew where he was going, he just didn't know quite what to expect when he got there. So uh, I was more wondering if he had access to writings from like the Spanish voyage. LaSalle actually carried one of the accounts from DeSoto with him. But he struggled mightily about the Mississippi River because the account from DeSoto's expedition didn't seem to match what LaSalle saw when he got on the lower Mississippi River. Remember, this, uh, in front of DeSoto and behind DeSoto, a wave of disease uh, uh, swept the natives. And some of the tribes that, that DeSoto encountered were extinct by the time LaSalle got there, and other, and other tribes had backfilled. LaSalle didn't have any idea about this. So he's trying to, trying to weigh these two, you know, DeSoto's account with what I saw, and try to figure out, was I on the same river as DeSoto's men? And he never was able to figure it. So just to kind of go back to the beginning of this conversation, okay. LaSalle's main goal was not, again, not to conquer, not to, not, at least for Native Americans. His goal was to establish a good relationship with the natives and to establish a seaport for the King of France on the, on the Gulf of Mexico. And That's why he went. And this would eventually become New Orleans. He was trying to find a spot. Actually, a little bit further than New Orleans. He said it was 60 leagues up the river, which would have put it at Donaldsonville. We all you remember Donaldsonville? We had a really nice dinner in Donaldsonville. Donaldsonville, which is just south of Baton Rouge. Kathy remembers those well because she spent a lot of time in those towns. <laughs> we spent one night, Kathy's back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> Donaldsonville is about the area where he wanted to settle. So, uh, and, and why that? When you get to the lower Mississippi River, um, there's no real good ground for agriculture. It's swampy, it floods in the springtime. Uh, you might find a little piece of high ground, but it's, it's no place to build a settlement. So he had to come up the river further. And, uh, 
his plan was to be high and dry and not have to worry about the flooding that came in the springtime. So that's why he's so far north. Of course, New Orleans turned out to be quite the settlement, didn't it? Eventually. Yeah. Of course, that's the Spanish that did that, but... Uh, you know, so it's still, it's still very interesting, you know, going down there trying to find his son. And every, obviously, he, he didn't succeed, but that was more due to faulty instruments and human error. LaSalle, LaSalle, if you read LaSalle's letters and you read the accounts of, of Henri de Tonti, Mark, mm -hmm. if you read Tonti's, uh, there are two different accounts that Tonti left. If you read their accounts, uh, you will see that LaSalle was struggling mightily with determining where he was at every moment on the river. Uh, he had a faulty astrolabe, which gave him uh, latitude readings that were two degrees too far south. He'd broken his compass at the mouth of the Illinois River. They only had one compass. Who leaves on a 3,000 mile trip with one compass? Sal did it, and he broke his compass. So navigation was difficult. They used the sun to determine where they were, and, um, and he took as many readings as he possibly could, recorded all that data, and came to the conclusion that since all the maps, all the world maps showed that the Gulf of Mexico was a simple arc with a northernmost uh, latitude of 30 degrees, he concluded that he must have exited uh, the Gulf of Mexico on the western shore at 27 degrees of latitude. That's two full degrees south of the actual mouth of the river. They had no idea the delta existed. So, so it was faulty maps, faulty measurements, and uh, some really bad luck for the south. And it seems like he had a lot of bad luck on his expedition. He had some difficult times, yeah. 1679 and 1682 when it ended. You know, in my mind, when I was researching this, you know, I would think of it as actually like several different expeditions. You know, it's all one expedition, but he kept having to go back to Montreal for supplies. The and one expedition that we recreated, uh, LaSalle was a, had to go to Montreal because he had to put some fires out that were started by the intendant. Um, accusations of illegal trading, so he went to meet with Frontenac. Frontenac wasn't there. So on uh, August 11th, he left uh, Quebec. I'm sorry, he left Montreal and went down to Fort Frontenac. And that's when, August 11th, when he left Montreal is when we decided that's when we're going to start this journey, that expedition. His entire five years worth of work entailed several expeditions to Illinois. Uh, and, and it's more than one expedition. We just did the last expedition to LaSalle did, that last one to the Gulf of Mexico. So he tried three times to get there but couldn't get there. So, Prior to the expedition where Colin and LaSalle got killed, of course. <laughs> Prior to the expedition <laughs> where they were murdered, right? So what were some of the other hardships that he faced during all of, all of this time? You know, you were saying that he had to keep going back to Montreal, you know, because there were schemes from the intendant and the... Communication was tough. How do you get word from Illinois to Quebec about what's going on? Well, you get two guys in a canoe and you send them with a letter. I mean, it's still so hard. We have Three phones. months later, they get to Quebec and, you know, the letter gets there. And then, and then they get in the canoe and they bring a letter. And that's how it worked. LaSalle actually sent uh, dispatches by canoe. Canoe mail. Remember Mrs. Brown? Yeah. She didn't invent that. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, that's a hardship. Communication was a hardship. Trying to overcome the superstitions and fears of his men that were instilled by the natives and by, by the Jesuits. Uh, that was a real hardship for him. But when it finally all settled down, there were about 40 men who were, who, who were the most loyal. And uh, the character that, that Sam played, Gabriel Barbier, actually started his, his interaction with LaSalle uh, by mutinying at the Michelin Mackinac. He was part of a, an advanced group that was supposed to go out to Illinois, and he just deserted. But, but when LaSalle finally caught up with him, uh, he explained himself, and LaSalle said, you know, um, it's okay, we're, we're, we're just, we're, we're, we'll stick together and do this. Gabriel Barbier became one of LaSalle's staunchest allies and supporters. And, and André Anon, uh, Chuck's uh, character was the same way. He had deserted and gone to, to Sault Ste. Marie from Michelin Mackinac, and, and Tonti captured him, and he became one of LaSalle's closest associates in North America. Two of them started out that way, but, but you know, LaSalle talked to his men. He wasn't a brutal, horrible man. 
And he took them back in. He said, look, it's okay. Come on back and let's work together and let's get this job done. So those two men became two of his most loyal men. And they were, one of them was with him almost the day he died. That was Gabriel Barbier. He actually went to Texas with LaSalle. So he was able to overcome this when he was able to have close associations, associations with the men, but we're strung out, you know, a thousand miles. How do you get, keep control, maintain control of these people? Many of them were actually soldiers from Fort Frontenac. So the people that were with him the longest, uh, uh, um, Anon and Barbier, were with him from the beginning of this stuff. Uh, they stayed with him to the end. Some of the people that were, the people that, that deserted, um, they were involved very early on, they left and they were gone. But after that first round of desertions through Illinois, there were no problems with his men. They stayed with him right to the end, loyal. So then that leads me to another question. So what were some of the major uh, players on this expedition? You know, you have LaSalle, who were the people like, he was financing it himself, if I remember correctly, but there were, who were else was involved? They don't have to be on the LaSalle list. had, this is an interesting story. LaSalle had one major financial uh, contributor. His name was Etienne Thore, and he was a merchant uh, who centered in, in La Rochelle, and he owned several ships, and his, his business was to bring hides to Canada, uh, to, to France. He brought them from Africa, he brought them from the Caribbean, and he would bring them back to, to France. Why was, why was it so important to bring hides to, to uh, France? Uh, France? France's agriculture was based on wheat. Everywhere in France they grew wheat. The staple in France, the thing that kept people from dying was bread. They didn't have enough land to, to raise cattle. Uh, they didn't have enough cattle to send meat to the Caribbean. That's why they imported it from Ireland. So there were no cattle. If there are no cattle, there's no leather. And the whole army marched on leather. You had to have a constant supply of hides. And that's why LaSalle's 100,000 uh, uh, bison per year proposal to bring to France, uh, those hides would have been the leather that, they, that the army actually marched on. It was a very important commodity. Uh, so, so, um, I don't know how I got to where I'm at. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> We're talking about the major players on the expedition. Oh, the major players. One of them was Thore, who was this man who was going to ship the the uh, the goods down. Another thing that I've been doing a lot of research about Henri Tonti. Henri de Tonti was a very important component to this expedition, to this whole enterprise. Tonti spent four years as a naval cadet. He was Italian, who an Italian who came to France as an infant, and he grew up as a Frenchman. He knew he, his first language was probably Italian at home, but also French. Um, he was in the, in, the, in, the, in the Naval Academy where he was taught how to build ships, how to design ships, how to build fortifications, and how to lead men. How important was that to LaSalle? Henri de Tonti oversaw all the construction of the forts, and he oversaw all the construction of the ships. Henri de Tonti was pivotal to LaSalle's plans. And, and it's been really gone unrecognized. He was a, a very important component of, of what was going on. Uh, several of the men, Michel Acou, who wasn't on the, the expedition to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, was the first man that LaSalle sent into the wilderness. He sent, he sent Michel Acou to Illinois before he even went to France in 1677. Michel Acou was out there making contact with the Illinois Indians before LaSalle even returned from France. Nobody knows about Michel Acou, uh, at least, not from an expedition because he wasn't part of that. Um, so there were several major players that, that played in on, on uh, what was happening. Uh, Le Sire de Boisvendé was another one, Keith's Keith character. He was an important, pivotal uh, person in leading the men and keeping them together. So there were several people that LaSalle depended on and they were very loyal and, and, and trusted uh, people in his, in his enterprise. So this wasn't by any means a one-man show. There were a lot of important players in his enterprise. Which then leads me to one of my final questions that I do want to ask about the background. What, you guys were all portraying actual people during this expedition. What, you know, obviously, some of them have a lot more written on them. You know, Reese LaSalle has a ton written on him. Mark, Mark's uh, uh, Tonti has a ton written on him. He has his own like written accounts of the expedition. Mm -hmm. you know, but what do you guys know about the characters you guys were portraying? You know, I know some of them might not have. Uh, I've shared what I can with these guys. What, tell me what I know. Uh, I think you, you've already mentioned it. Um, you know, it was a, a soldier in uh, 
deserted LaSalle at one point, came back, uh, traveled with him as a loyal follower till the end. Andre No walked with LaSalle from central Illinois all the way back up to Niagara. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that trip? That's the first European had been through that area. He walked with them. That was after he deserted. So, so to, to think that these people didn't like him or were alienated is wrong. Uh, Gabriel Barbier, he went with us to his death with LaSalle in Texas. I got um, with him in the fort. Right, right. And you were Antoine Boissard, weren't you? Yes, yeah. I was. Antoine was a soldier at Fort Frontenac, another <laughs> soldier at Fort Frontenac. This was a military operation. Antoine was a character that had been around the block a time or two. He spoke Iroquois fluently, so he must have spent much time with the Iroquois and probably did a little illegal trading on the side because, you know, <laughs> that's probably how it worked because everybody did at that time. So the snippets that I've been able to get out of the research, we didn't have access to the stuff that I have. Uh, at that time, it was, uh, uh, it was really, really a, an awakening in the country at that time about history. And that leads us to why we did the expedition. And that's how we all got involved, and that's because Reed had a plan. I don't know if uh, Bob or Mark, you guys wanted to add anything to? I was just going to ask Rich if he's come across anything else, because my, my character, Colin Cravel, was LaSalle's nephew. And the feeling was he was probably on the expedition because the uh, Crevel family had put money into the venture. And he was there basically to keep an eye on the money and make sure that it's and, used correctly. And that's but what he we thought, yeah. And that's what we yeah, thought before we left. That's exactly what we thought, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Colin Crevel but, was actually another soldier from Fort Frontenac. The Colin Crevel that was LaSalle's nephew was a young boy. Uh, he went with LaSalle um, to, to, to Texas. And he was, he was really a child. He was probably into his teenage years when he finally was, uh, made his way back from, from Texas. So we that's thought, why I'm so much younger than all the rest of you guys. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and that's one of the things. So we, we did the research we could, and we thought that, but it turns out that's not, like many of the things that we thought, wasn't quite what the history turned out to be. So Colin, uh, Colin was a very loyal, um, uh, person to LaSalle, and he started out, and, and Bob, I actually think Colin had a brother, because there was another Crevel who was a soldier at Fort Frontenac at that time, so my guess is that there was a Crevel family in, in Canada, and sometimes you can actually Google the name, and people doing genealogy will come up with uh, more information about, about, the, about Colin or, or, or even his brother. So uh, if you're interested one day, you might just start Googling that name, you might find something. And he, he's the one who actually stabbed Tonti too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Can we react, we react that one? <laughs> please, please not here. Well, I, I think that's another little bit of a, a twist in history there, and I don't think he did. <laughs> but he might have thought about it. I don't. <laughs> Speaking of Tonti, uh, I was going to ask Mark, you know, did you actually, did you have a metal hand? Because, you know, Tonti lost his hand in, in Sicily. Well, for, for quite a while, I was supposed to wear a rubber glove signaling that I had an iron hand, but it's very hard to paddle with an iron hand, so no. And here's another thing, Mark, that I learned in the research. And you're going to feel really cheated now when you hear this. Tonti only had one hand. I've been married hand. for 40 years. <laughs> Tonti only had one hand. He didn't paddle a lick. Oh. Not once. <laughs> As it should have been. As it should have been. <laughs> See, now you could have been, you could have been uh, sitting high and dry in the middle of the canoe the whole time and well rested. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember him paddling at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he did imitate history. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, we, 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 have, we have a little bit of time here for uh, a Q and A. Um, thank you for answering that question. Uh, someone was asking to introduce who the people on uh, Zoom were. So I was going to say, with, you know, uh, Bob Kulik and Mark Lieberman, who were part of the part of the expedition. Um, another question that we had asked was, someone was wondering how to spell. Colbert, and I think they actually spelled it right. It's C O L B E R T, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. And 
Um, I don't know if anyone else. I, I would like Reed to explain um, the origin of the expedition. Why did we do it? I think that's a question mm -hmm. we haven't touched. Yeah, on. that's what I said, actually was going to be the the next. Oh, that's the next part. Yeah, okay, so good. That's actually was going to be so we can jump right on it. Good. So, you know, so now we're gonna. Maybe, you know, if you need a drink of water, you know. You can oh, good. We're good. Thank you. But, uh, you know, we now are going to talk about the LaSalle 2 expedition. Water you know, so it was like, why, why do this? You know, why, what was the idea behind this? You know, you guys, at the time, you guys were all young. You guys were like 18, 19. You know, and you guys were with, with teachers like Reed and his brother and I don't remember who the other teachers were, but there were other teachers yeah, with you guys true. at the time. Yeah. You know, so that, what, what was it like doing this? And first off, and why, why even, why do this? You know, it was a lot of, it seems like a lot of uh, work to go into doing something like this. Well, it was New Year's Eve, and it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, there were two primary reasons. Um, can you understand me? Is that better? Yeah. yeah. There are two main reasons I wanted to do this. First of all, um, sorry. Take the mask off. Yeah. Sure, pull it down. Yeah, pull it down. Pull it down. Pull it down. Sure. Yeah. There you go. There. <sighs> Much better. <laughs> um, the two main reasons in my mind it was 1976, our bicentennial. Everybody was talking about East Coast history, English history. Nobody was saying much about the French part of our history. And I thought, well, if we as uh, citizens of the Midwest, where we had our origins with the French, We've got to speak up. That was one reason. But the closest reason to my heart was as a teacher, I am sick and tired of people saying, oh, the youth of today couldn't do this or that. And I thought, well, we're going to do this expedition with the youth of today to show people what they are capable of doing but they've got to have guidance. And so that's how we started. Um, Ralph. Yeah, well, and another thing, a friend of ours, Ralph Fries, who um, had the uh, Chicago Land Canoe Base, s selling canoes in Chicago, um, he and I had been close for years through scouts and all. and. Uh, we did another expedition before our LaSalle expedition where we reenacted Joliet and Marquette's voyage. Well, after we did that, that made me see how we can do this. And then what I did was give a, um, a presentation for the schools in Elgin to propose, here's what I'd like to do. Are there any students who would like to do that? And there were some. <laughs> and so we began training with a group. And this was part of the selection process also. But we uh, have camping trips. And I would say, uh, we need somebody to build a fire and watch to see who volunteered. Because some people, when there's work to be done, look the other way. I like fire, that's why I started. <laughs> <laughs> I had no that's problem right. with that. That was the fire builder. But that, that was part of the process of selecting. And then the adult crew members, um, which there were just what were we, six? Seven. 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 Sorry, I said seven. Um, the seven adult crew members we formed uh, for this one way of selecting students. We formed a panel 
like we would find in each city along the way of reporters. And one by one, the students had to present themselves to this board of reporters. And they could ask questions and help us select who was going to go. For instance, one of the questions the reporters asked was, you know, I was uh, talking to some of your crew members, and I noticed they, some of them smoked pipes. And that tobacco didn't smell like normal tobacco. <laughs> now, we don't want people using drugs in our community. Do you think that's right? And this one student said, no, they shouldn't do that. Rather than defend them, he was protecting himself. Obviously, that student was not selected. So it was things like that that helped us realize who, who would be a contributing member and really um, you know, get involved with the expedition. So that was part of the process of the crew. What was the rest of the question? So uh, my other part of the question is like, what were you guys thinking like during like the during like the training process when I, I heard one story where you guys were camping and then in the middle of the night, Reed just starts shouting and running through the woods waking everyone up. I don't know if that was, it may have been different, I just remember reading that. But what were you guys thinking during, you know, the training process and while you guys were actually on this expedition, what or was, what was going through your heads? Well, I'd like, to, I'd, I'd like to say something about what Reed said in the selection process. Um, as a student, I thought the selection process was very scary. Yeah. You know, and, <laughs> and not knowing, and you had a lot of anxiety going into this. Um, and I didn't make the first cut. I didn't make the second cut. I didn't get on the expedition until an original uh, member uh, decided to, he didn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't part of this thing, and they asked me to get involved, and so that's how I got involved, after uh, everybody else was selected. But I also stayed involved by making things after school, during school, and I still participated, even though I wasn't uh, asked to be part of the original crew. I do remember that Reed told me to go find that Sam guy. We were in gym class together. Do you remember that? We were in gym class together. I said, Sam. Reed wants to talk to you. He wants you to go on a trip. I remember that. I, I forgot. I forgot all about that until you just told that story. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was interesting. Yeah. If I could add too, from the student perspective, you're asking about why do the expedition. Um, from my part, and I think I think a fair number of the students felt this way too. It was the grand adventure. Oh, yeah. You know, you're you're sitting there as a junior in high school. I got out of math class to be able to go to this presentation, so I was excited. <laughs> you know, I didn't care what it was about, but as he's telling the story of what we're gonna do, sleep out under the canoe. I remember sitting there with my friends as he's saying, We're gonna sleep out under the canoe every night and we're gonna hit Chicago in early December. And we looked at each other and said, This guy's crazy. Mm -hmm. And he said, How many people would be interested? And I looked down and every one of us had our hand up. Uh, of that group of friends, I'm the only one that followed through on it and actually actually did it. But it was that grand adventure going on. It. What I didn't realize at the time, and I think I realized it as we were going through the process, like you're talking about that, I, I remember very well that two o'clock in the morning, Reed running through and waking us all up on the camping trip, you know, pack everything up, and we ran two miles back out yeah. through the, the trees because he wanted to see how how we would react to that, who would help each other and things like that. But what I learned along the way was how that formed me. And uh, each one of us, um, I, I think, uh, you look at it and we've all been successful in our chosen careers. Was that because of who they chose for the expedition or was that because of the, the forming that happened to us all in the expedition? Probably a little bit of both, but um, I, I I say this is a huge part of who I am as a person, and, and I think a lot of the expedition members feel the same way. This was a changing point in their lives. Mm -hmm. There's another aspect that we should address. Imagine if your son 
comes to you and said, Dad, I just heard about this expedition and I want to go on it. Have your child to go on what is obviously a very dangerous endeavor. And so I had an assembly where the students brought their parents and gave them an opportunity to ask questions and gave me an opportunity to explain. And it did help that I had done the Joliet Marquette expedition, so I had some experience and I could share it with them and tell them some of the things we were gonna do to make it as safe as possible. And one thing that was ingrained in all of us is don't play macho with mother nature. As Zsa Zsa Gabor said, macho does not prove mucho. <laughs> so, and the parents were very supportive. As was, and I would like to also thank the community of Elgin because people volunteered to knit mittens, socks, and so it could be authentic. And, you know, in the wintertime, you don't want to wear leather. You know, you want wool. And part of this, for the, historically, a lot of the voyageurs were from um, the part of France, Brittany and Normandy, that are on the sea coast, and a lot of them are from um, families where they're, they were fishermen and all. So they were used to dealing with the weather and wearing the right clothing. Um, yeah, uh, before you, we were talking about building fires, and I remember one icy, frigid Arctic morning uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan, and we slept under the canoes, and I peeked out and I looked at, toward our fire pit. And there was Gabriel Barbier, Sam Hess. And he was one of our primary uh, fire builders. It was storming out. The wind was blowing sleep horizontally. And he was down on his hands and knees with flint and steel. And he had a fire going faster than you could do it with an acetylene torch. <laughs> I think that was the time he stole my spark, but uh, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> uh, bef before we continue, someone did ask if any of the canoes still exist. Um, yes, you uh, just saw one of the, uh, the Ralph Freeze canoes. Um, yes, the, some of them do still exist. There's actually one that was just up on the uh, screen here, and that's the one that we have in the museum here, and that was actually Reed's canoe. But now when you say Ralph Reed's, they were designed by what Ralph Reed's, they were made by our crew. And that was an incredible feat. I mean, the students, now we're not talking the adults, the students built the canoes. And of course, there is a little factor that your life depends on this canoe Do a good job. You know, at that point of building the canoes, we didn't realize how much and how far we could go with these devices that we were building. We yeah. just thought that we were building these things. Yeah. And this was our transportation, our, our sleeping arrangements, oh. our everything was the canoe. And uh, you learn to really respect that and take care of it. And you want to also tell about how the paddles came into existence? Go ahead, Chuck. I, I'm not sure about Well, the, you, you had to make them. You oh, made, made your own. Yeah. You made your paddles, yes. Mm -hmm. had to make your own paddle. Mm -hmm. And it's ash. And and ash made stock. Yes. We had this ash stock, and we had to hand hew all the uh, paddles by hand. And everybody made their own paddles, yeah. uh, custom fit. I think the other the other part of the, I mean, Bob mentioned the the grand adventure of this trip, which I think is true for many of us. Um, we all had different uh, reasons to go, but uh, it was an adventure. It was you know do this or 
my parents were ready to let me go and hike the Appalachian Trail as on a solo trip after graduation. I think they were much more relieved that I was going on a trip with 23 other people. <laughs> uh, for right, or for good or for bad, it, 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 uh, it worked out just great. But I think the other part of the, the planning, as we got more and more involved in the making of the canoes, making of our paddles, making of our muskets, making of our axes, uh, making our sea chests, all the whole things we made, our clothing, as we, the more we, every stitch that we made when we were making clothing, the more involved we got and more of a lifestyle it became. Um, I can't tell you the number of days that I spent in uh, <laughs> the public radio that the school district used to have. I sat there engineering programs while I was sewing moccasins or sewing a shirt or, or, or uh, finger weaving a sash. Um, and it became a lifestyle not only for the of the expedition, but the preparation became a lifestyle. We were lucky that we'd let us have the day off to go to prom. We would meet. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and, well, then I'm not sure if I thank you or not for that. Um, <laughs> no no was, offense to those, those that I attended prom with, but um, I think that we we um, we met to, you know several times a week and every weekend for a long time, and um, it was our, our lifestyle. It was for two years. We prepared for two years. So for me, um, I remember that assembly so well. Yeah. Reed walked out in his regalia as Monsieur LaSalle, and I was in awe. I'm a theater uh, lover, and so I thought, oh my god, what is this? And he talked with so much passion and so much excitement about this grand adventure. And this was our junior year, and, that, and I was sitting next to my friend Sally Robinson. And, um, we were so excited at the end, and he said, and this is for the young men in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sally and I looked at each other and went, oh my God, are you kidding me? We got out of class and it's not going to be for us. And Sally was disgusted, and I thought, well, fine, great. So we walked out of the assembly, and I thought, huh, well. They're just a bunch of sexists, that's all. <laughs> and I went about forgetting about it, right, for a year until the crew started coming into homeroom and coming into any quiet class that we had, sewing moccasins, yeah. sewing shirts, sewing things. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? And I think, I don't know if I asked you or if I asked um, Gary, you know, what is what are you doing? And they said, well, this is the LaSalle expedition. Remember that assembly we went to? And I said, Oh my gosh, you're really going. This is incredible. And so when the, um, the call came out for uh, people to apply for the liaison team, I turned to Sally and I said, hey, we should do this. And she said, are you kidding? I'm not going to do that. They're sexist. And I went, really? Because I think it's kind of a grand adventure. I don't know. I think I'm going to try. And so I did. And it was the best decision I ever made. And my parents let me, their only daughter, uh, and I have six brothers, go on this trip um, wholeheartedly because they, they trusted Reed and the things that he said, and uh, only my grandmother opposed it. <laughs> but my, my mom and dad were, you know, I grew up with six brothers, so what's, you know, a few more, right? They were pretty sure I could hold my own, and um, it was it a, grand, a grand time. So. You were like a sister. And I felt really like were. a sister. I mean, I felt definitely like... Somebody to confide in, somebody to wash your clothes for you. Without her, we'd have been yep. in trouble. <laughs> Go get your mail, all that stuff, yeah. Not the yep. sisters wash clothes, but you helped us a lot. I did wash clothes. You, we could have done it without you. That's all right. And while we're talking about the liaison team, without which there would not have been an expedition, uh, my wife, Jan, began... She was head of the liaison team, and I'll be forever indebted to her because without her, there wouldn't have been an expedition. And she began, before we'd even selected the crew, writing letters to the towns along the route to see if they wanted to become involved and how they would become involved. And then um, she would work with my parents, uh, Burr and Pat Lewis, they had an office. The LaSalle Bank in Chicago donated an office to us on LaSalle Street. And 
My folks worked 14 hours a day being the link between the liaison team and the towns, you know, with me, you know, you gotta remember, there were no cell phones, right. no computers, it was all the old typing, you know, typewriters, and they uh, had to put up with all kinds of interesting, challenging moments. I'll give you one example. We had two vans, and we had the uh, liaison team split in two. One van would uh, meet us as we arrived in a town and show us, now here's where you're gonna camp, here's the schedule, you're, gonna visit, you're going to visit schools. And uh, the other van was in the next town preparing the town and finding out where should they camp and all. Well, one day when we had uh, a little downtime, my wife, Jan, came to me and said, could you come to this next town where you're going to be going and talk to the chairman of their committee? Because um, Jan had told, or well, first the man told her where he wanted our crew to land. There was a seawall there. <laughs> no way we could land. And so my wife explained that, that couldn't land there because it's, yeah. He said, well, if that's not good enough, tell him to keep going. <laughs> so that's why she called me if I could talk to this fellow. The minute he saw the costume, oh, that's not good enough. <laughs> oh, what would you suggest? <laughs> uh -huh. The costume and the whole atmosphere created uh, just a magic with uh, people. And that's why I... I'm so grateful to the liaison team. They didn't have the costume, and that's why they got negative feedback sometimes, although most of the towns were very welcoming. But still, it was a very difficult situation um, that they portrayed. But without the liaison team, we couldn't have done the expedition. And without Jan, I mean, it's no small task that Jan did put that itinerary together. So when Sharon and I, who were the student part of the liaison team, when we got involved, we got involved pretty late, like maybe six months before the trip took out. I, I took off, I think. Um, it was already done. But where we were going, the connections in each town was already formed and so when Sharon and I we got to be the front people who went and, and met people and um, and introduced and, and made sure things were right but all that hard work of putting that itinerary together was really Jan working with all the crew to to make sure it was accurate of where they wanted to go um, so that follow LaSalle's trip but that was a lot of logistical work that never got seen and never got appreciated um, by anybody other than you know the crew itself. The crew definitely appreciated us, so that was all worth it. I mean, we did, it wasn't about us. We didn't have the costumes like Reed said. It wasn't supposed to be about us. It was supposed to be about us supporting the trip. And so we were happy to do that. So happy to do that. So, and it was an honor to be a part of all that. And to clarify what exactly their role was, I mean, Kathy's done a good job of explaining. Besides having to make actually an appointment to be in a place at a time two years before we arrived, <laughs> right. that was done. And then to go and reconfirm that appointment, but not only that, where are we going to camp? Do we have firewood? Uh, where's the presentation going to be? Uh, are there any special events? Are we going to visit schools? Is there a nursing home we're going to? Uh, and, and then they had to do that every town we stopped in. This was a daily grind for them that was just grueling. And Sharon and I, were we were 17 and 18 at the time. Right. So, I mean, can young people do this? Yes, yes. they can. You know, with the guidance and support of the adults, we could. We we had to talk on the phone to people, and I remember the first time I was making the phone call, I thought, I, don't, I have to talk to the mayor of this town. And I think Jan said to me, you know, he's just a regular person, and he can't see you on the other end of the phone, 
So you just say the things that you need to say and you say them with confidence and he will listen to you. And I'm like, okay. So from that point on, you know, I never feared um, making those kind of appointments and, and reaching out because I thought I can, I can do this. I have somebody who's told me I can do this, so I can do it. And while she's doing that, she's arranging for, for me to have a shower, <laughs> and she's arranging to have my clothes cleaned, and she's arranging that I have a good night's sleep and have something to eat. So Food I, drops. <laughs> Without them, we couldn't have done it. Well, and I, not to mention the fact that, that <laughs> that schedule they put together two years in advance, when you have the worst work, uh, winter oh, yeah. in recorded history, yeah. and you know, snow changed. days or wave days or whatever, they would throw off the itinerary, and we're, we're stuck in camp, we're, we're walking slower than we normally had, had anticipated, and they're the ones that have to make all the changes to it, so, and, and figure that, that, that the whole thing out, so that's... Right, and, and, the day that, and the day that we left the canoes in East Chicago, oh and, and really we saw them for a little bit on the Kankakee, but didn't see them again until, until uh, Chester, Illinois, every one of those plans was up in the air. They had to do it all over again because we couldn't keep right. our itinerary. We right. couldn't. We couldn't make that campsite. We couldn't make the miles in a day. I know. I dragged my butt in every day. I was probably last in line every day. That walk just was difficult. And as difficult as it was on us, they were the ones who were taking the brunt because we weren't keeping our obligations. It was tough. So I always say that I am a plate juggler by trade. So, and I, if you know what that is, it's kind of dating us. So a plate juggler, there's a long pole and the plate's on top and you spin it. And it, then it's not just one plate. You have a room full of plates and you have to keep every single one of them spinning. So <laughs> if you don't, they fall and crash. So that was not an option to let things crash. So I learned from the expedition how to be a plate juggler extraordinaire. And that has served me my whole life in everything that I've done as a camp director, as a, in a, you know, um, an administrator in school. Um, there's no crisis that you can't overcome. There's no, um, I can't do it. It's like, how can we get this done? So uh, I thank you. I, I am forever changed because I've yeah, I think that's what I was trying to get across before. The legacy that, that I think has left a lot of the crew members is yeah. exactly that. Yep. That, that ability to say, that there's no, no, we can't do it. There were organizations that said, um, you know, when you fail, it's going to look bad on us. Or, you know, when you fail, this is going to happen. And for us, it was like there, there was no option of failure we were going to do it and i think it shows the fact that every one of the guys that started the trip men and women who started the trip ended the trip because right. wasn't there a story where uh the barge pilots down in pilot, pilot, pilot town <laughs> bet that you guys can canoe all the way down the river and they bet you a bottle of whiskey and when you came back there's just a uh Lonely bottle of whiskey right there at the bar for you guys. He, he was quite certain that we'd go down, but he was equally certain we'd never make it back up that river. The current's too strong. We got back early. Mm -hmm. He just didn't know what a canoe could do. <laughs> and he did buy us a case of beer. <laughs> canoe in the right hands. Well. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, the hardest thing, as they say, I've done a few expeditions, and the hardest part of each expedition, people always ask me, what was the hardest part for you guys? I would say for each of the expeditions, getting along. Mm -hmm. Because it's not easy living on top of each other under very rigorous conditions. And uh, we all have our bad moments, mm -hmm. but nobody quit the expedition, and that's one thing I always marveled at, because it would have been so easy, especially as we got into the populated areas, especially going right to Chicago, my gosh, could jump on the next train and go home. <laughs> but nobody did that, and to this day I, I marvel at that. But again, that's the youth of today, <laughs> you know. They can do it if we have faith and we give them guidance. Well, my dad said that we left as boys and we came back as men. And I truly believe that. Uh, for what I learned 
not out of the book, but in society. Mm -hmm. And how to deal with people. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, as my friend Howard Platt liked to say, whatever the project, whatever you think it's about, it ain't. <laughs> it's about people. Mm -hmm. And that certainly came true. Um, I don't know uh, if, if Mark, if you had anything you wanted to, to add. Wake add up, Mark. Are you there? Wake up, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is billable hours for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm awake. <laughs> no, I, um, actually, I, I think Reed has a, a, a point. I, I always say the hardest thing was interpersonal relations. Um, living with 23 guys for two and a half years um, is difficult. And it's remarkable to me, we really never had any fist fights, but um, living that close together and having the pressures that we were under, especially in adverse weather, uh, was often difficult. And, and I, it took me about six months to realize that, um, six months after the expedition to realize that it, it was really the um, the stress from being that close together and having to work together with that group of guys for that period of long a long period that was most stressful to me. Yeah, you know, I've only you know, I've I've done work on some archaeological sites. We lived together for like a month, right on top of each other. We're not we're not paddling all the way from Montreal, you know, but we're still you know we're still doing physical work. And at the end of that month, sometimes I'm just like, you know what, guys, that's your corner. Here's my corner, mm. you know. But well, and as the expedition evolved, and at the beginning, we each took um, roles within our roles within our groups, our three tent groups. Uh, there was a fire starter, there was a cook, there was a, a wood gatherer, there was somebody that set up the shelter right away. So we each had our role within our small groups. And every night you slept next to the same guy, you know, and the next morning it was the same routine. You get up, make a fire, eat, you know, paddle for a while, stop and eat, you know. Um, so it was pretty, I don't want to say mundane, but you knew what to expect. And then the weather turned and it was game over. So. <laughs> One of the things, just going back then, I think something Kathy said reminded me of it, that it, um, one of the things I found interesting was that for that eight months on the trip, I mean, we were in the newspaper, we were in the news, we were on the radio, we were, we were celebrities, we were, you know, you'd get out from under the canoe in the morning and there'd be people lined up to get your autograph and things like that. But I thought it was amazing that it didn't seem to go to the crew member's head because it was, again, it goes back to I think the training that we went through because it was all about the mission. The, the, it was to accomplish this mission and to teach the things that we need to teach along the way. What it did do, though, was I think we, we've talked about that among some of the the crew since then, it gave us a lot more empathy for tr true celebrities that have to live that way. Because we would say, <clears throat> you know, we could do this for eight months, for nine months, um, and then we could go back to that town and nobody would know who we are. But to have that level of stress every day, because we, we didn't have any any modern clothes. We all had the, the outfits from the expedition. So everybody knew who we were everywhere we went. And so we were on show everywhere we went. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And to live that life, there's, a, there's that, that level of stress that was there. Um, but we'd looked at it and said, hey, we're having the time of our lives doing this. And you know, five months, six months from now, we can come back here, walk these streets, and that one person will give us a second look. But to live your life every day that way, I think we got, it makes it much more empathetic for people who are in the spotlight all the time. Yeah, and in, and in that... In the, during the expedition, we, we had jobs to do. It was our job. We had, as Sam said, you knew what you were going to do when you hit shore, and we are going to get it done. And it was the same every day. It was a different location, and there were different obstacles, but it was the same every day. I remember when we landed in New Orleans. Have you, you know, you've seen the pictures landing in New Orleans, and 
And uh, of course, I was in front of Reed's canoe, so we landed, and a reporter rushed up to me and said, aren't you excited, aren't you thrilled? You're the first one to land. And I said, I'm always the first one to land. I'm in front of LaSalle's <laughs> canoe, and LaSalle's canoe always lands first. And he said, oh, okay, you, 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 it's not quite what the outside thought it was. Buddy, I'm just doing my job here, you know? <laughs> Let Reed get out of the canoe. <laughs> So, That's a true story. <laughs> so we actually had someone just uh, ask a question here. If we, if you guys would be able to speak to the hardships of both the the winter the cold and then the summer heat that you guys were, which was harder, do you think? think? Yeah. I mean, personally, I would say the winter. You know, I thought the summer was harder. I thought the summer was a lot harder. Yeah. Too many bugs, and you couldn't get cool. In winter, you always warm up. Yeah. The hardest part about winter was when we had to go inside. I remember stripping down to your, to your underwear and just nothing because you're sweat, you're dying. You really wanted to get out of that building back where you're comfortable outside by the fire. It's just too warm inside. During Thanksgiving, my parents met us in Zion, Illinois. Oh, yeah. And Snow that um, I just had uh, a shirt on. Yeah. And they had jackets on, they were cold, it was breezy out. And my mom kept saying, aren't you gonna put a jacket on? I'm fine, Mono, I'm fine. But she couldn't understand, once you live outside, you become more accustomed to your environment. Yeah. And it, it's really true, if you don't have heat all the time, you're not accustomed to it. Uh, you know, so the cold is not so bothersome. Right. You know, because you're there at the change of the seasons. Right. I, I think we, we adapted what we could for the winter. Um, we talked uh, informally about, you know, you dip your wool mitten in the, in the water to get an ice coating so the wind won't go through it. But the, in the summertime, one of the things in the 70s we didn't know about was sunscreen. Yeah. We didn't wear sunscreen. Burn. Yeah. I mean, there, there was a lot, of, a lot of things that we did that weren't part of the, the first aid safety culture that it is now. Nobody worried. You know, and, and, you know, and I'm sure you know, many of us are experiencing today some sun damaged skin that we have to deal with every, every year. Um, but we didn't know those things back then. And the heat and the sun, um, took a lot out of you. The cold, if you were a person that really enjoyed the, the warmth, you know, that took a lot out of you as well. And um, so, I don't think there's one that was more detrimental to the group as a summer or winter, but I think that collectively, I think that it was those dangers of health and safety that yeah. were prevalent. Yeah, I'd like to enlarge upon what you started saying about the uh, mittens. We wore two pair of hand-knitted wool mittens. And what you do, when you paddle a canoe, you can't help but get your hands wet. But what we do is very quickly dip the back of the mitten into the water, and that would you know, wet the uh, exterior mitten, which would then almost immediately freeze. And then the mitten underneath would keep you warm. And then on the exterior, yeah, they keep building up ice, and every now and then you'd have to hit the gunnel of the canoe to break off some of that ice. But you were warm, and people would see that and say, aren't your hands freezing? In? But we learned, and, and this is again from studying history, uh, you learn little tricks like that that, that they had. I don't remember being cold. I just, it didn't affect me like that. Oh, we, only a couple times. We were, in, we were in peak in Illinois. We were a big snowstorm. You remember that big, big snowstorm in the circus tent? And the wind must have been blowing 40 miles an hour and blew the tent over. Two o'clock yeah. in the morning, it's 20 below zero, wind chills around 60 below. And we're out there, you know, in our skivvies just trying to put the tent back up. Didn't think anything of it. You remember that, guys? Oh, yeah. Very well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was a cold night. but. You know, it was just another day you had to go and fix something that happened. But what I remember Actually. is about how hot you were when you came inside. Yeah. And, and that it was just very unpleasant for you to be inside after being out yeah. in the winter. And, you know, taking off your clothes and then I'm picking up stuff and like, don't leave it here. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> make sure everybody had everything when they left. I know Mark or Bob wanted to, to say something. 
Well, I, I remember, I thought it was Peoria in Illinois, not Pekin, but maybe I was wrong. Uh, it was, uh, uh, and I think it was 70 below wind chill, and well, I do remember it. I do remember we had to double up on sleeping bags that yeah. night because it was so cold. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, maybe you and Bob, but not the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, I, Bob and I actually did. Uh, Mark, I said never talk about that. <laughs> That's but, the stuff uh, we don't talk about. No. <laughs> uh, he was quite. He was quite comfortable. But anyway. <laughs> but uh, the weather wasn't the only thing you guys had to. Well, to deal with. I would like to talk about, a little bit about the environment. We drank water yeah, out of the lakes and rivers until the upper Lake Michigan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we decided to stop drinking the water mm -hmm. due to pollution, pollution or bacteria due to, due in the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and See, I, show I found show that how we drank it. Well, you would stick your paddle in the water and then Put it up and you'd hold your thumb out and the water running down your paddle would run off your thumb right into your mouth so we that's how you floss it so you dip it down and drink water right off the is that how you did it i just dipped my mug in the <laughs> <laughs> sammy they didn't give me a mug <laughs> uh, oh well you started to see then the environment changed yeah we the got environment the changed and um it was amazing to us where I saw the most pollution was um, on the Mississippi River. Uh, was some places was absolutely disgusting. What cities and towns were pumping into the river with no corns or cares what happens downriver from what they're pumping in there. Um, and some of it was looked pretty bad. You know, when you start seeing yellow water foaming, yeah. you know, it was it was nasty. And for us to go by that, the smell. You know, the toxic smell going by that was just pretty horrific. Well, this was also right around within the last 10 years. That's when the EPA was, was founded. So this was also yeah. right around the time where... First Earth Day, yeah, 1970, yeah, right? This was right around when, uh, as a country, we were trying to deal with, well, we can't have our rivers on fire every other day. What are, we should actually probably do something. Right. And there were, and there were, there were beaver lodges along the river that right. uh, not only did they have the sticks woven together, but they had garbage that was garbage into, into these right. dams as well, right. or into these lodges as well. So there was all kinds of different things that we saw that, that way. You know, I remember we, we I was it down by Olden, we was a, there was the dam that we went to, we saw the eagles, and that was such a big deal for us to see an eagle. You don't see eagles anywhere at that time. Now, they're in Schaumburg, they're in Elgin. There are eagles everywhere, and the reason why is because there's been huge strides in cleaning up the water. Eagles are, uh, eagles are fish-eating birds. And you clean up the water, the eagles will come back. Well, that DDT. But uh, the deep tunnel project in Chicago was the reason why the lower Mississippi was such a mess. They cleaned up Chicago. The entire river system's improved. Uh, they've gone and improved tremendous restoration projects on the Illinois River where they completely destroyed the environment for migratory birds. Now we've got Emaquan, Spunky Bottoms, the Hennepin Reserve. So much of the wildlife has come back simply because they're, they're the recognition of the problems that we saw and they were resolving some of those problems. So today it's much cleaner, much better than it was back in 76. But it we, was a mess. But we do have a long way to go. So but we have, we, we're just, you know, we've taken one giant step for man, but we've got a long way to go. That's right. So something uh, going along with uh, this drinking water topic, someone just asked, like, you know, what, what did you guys do for uh, drinking water when you got into the more polluted waterways of the Mississippi? Boda, remember? <laughs> well, that, that was one of our hair store comparisons. We had to carry water with us. I mean, mm -hmm. So we would carry it with us in water containers of different shapes, sizes, and forms. One of the things the liaison team made sure that they had water. So. I did like that, though. We had, we had those uh, <coughs> barrels, too. The barrels, wooden yeah. barrels that mm -hmm. were filled with water. And during yeah. the winter, they would freeze. Yeah. So somebody, I think it was Ken, came up with the idea of adding some rum to it. <laughs> <laughs> and when it, the water froze, the rum went to the top. Right, <laughs> 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 so... You know, and then as you guys said, we still we're still working on the environment. You know, was there a particular place in the United States that was like better at the time for environmental? Georgia Bay was gorgeous. Still is. 
The Georgia Bay is the most pristine part Untouched. of the Untouched. Yeah. We, uh, I, we got stuck in Georgian Bay uh, due to weather, and we ran out, ran out of provisions that we brought ourselves. And so this was on day two or three. We're all running, you know, standing around very, very hungry. Uh, so we started fishing, and we all caught little tiny fish. Well, I happened to pick up a stick that happened to be a pine stick, and I cooked my fish on it, so it tasted like <laughs> turpentine. <laughs> but you know, I was so hungry, I still ate it. Yeah. Okay. And it rained, right? As the right. fish were we we're, we're almost done, it started to rain. I Mine was half cooked when I went in and ate it. I just yeah, ate it. It was, it was exciting. It, yeah. was a, it was a different time where you really had to provide for yourself. It was you or... Yeah. And the, the streams at the time, they were very, very polluted. You know, the Kankakee River in Indiana is nothing but a, but a, but a ditch, a drainage ditch. They channelized it, took 100 miles of the river, cut those meanders out, made just a drainage ditch out of it. And um, we were convinced that with all the pollution, uh, the rivers aren't going to freeze. But it was so doggone cold, even the polluted river froze. The Mississippi River froze all the way down well, past St. Like Louis. Michigan froze. Lake Michigan froze across. Uh, all the rivers were frozen. And when we, when, we're, when we are walking down the Illinois River, we could see where barges were trying to make their way a, up a channel up the river, but they couldn't. And they, uh, they had left barges, uh, I should say tows were trying to make their way up the river, the engines. And uh, the barges were just left haphazardly where they, where they froze, literally froze into the river. You remember, and they were trying to catch barges as they were coming, hitting bridges, and they were all over the place yeah. in the springtime. When, when the melt came, those barges were list, left everywhere, so that was a big danger. Well, the Coast Guard didn't allow us on, on uh, Mississippi River because of the ice flows right. and the, co and the uh, breakaway barges. barges yeah. okay. And I, what I remember is we went anyhow. It was Chester, but there's still ice on the river, but we went yeah. in Chester. We went uh, on the Mississippi anyhow, what, and what they didn't realize is we had already encountered multiple ice flows on Lake Michigan and other, that was minor. The Kankakee River, I mean, it's all ice, so we knew how to deal with the ice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I know uh, Mark or Bob also wanted to, to say something earlier. Mark? Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's not, not me. I don't worry about <laughs> so um, to kind of start beginning, like wrapping up, wrapping up this program, uh, I had one question that I wrote down here at, at the end. It was, what do you think the lasting? I know we kind of touched a little bit on this for everyone, but what do you think the lasting impact of both your expedition and the original LaSalle expedition is? Yeah. Well, after the expedition. Um, we had taken a lot of pictures, so I made a multimedia presentation, and I traveled all over the world, um, France, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and then all over the North America. And of course, my, for the most part, my audiences are schools. and. If you could see the reaction, where it, it made the students feel, boy, if they can do that, I can do whatever. And I got a letter from a girl who uh, said, thank you very much for your presentation. I wasn't going to go to school that day, but I finally did. And after your presentation, I felt I had a reason to live. And the principal told me that we were very worried about that girl committing suicide. She was having all kinds of problems at home and whatnot. But there's just one example, and the, she wrote to me again, and said so I've now graduated from school. I'm teaching school down in, it was one of the southern states. But she said again, literally, <coughs> excuse me, you literally saved my life with your presentation. And that's why I want all the crew members to understand, too, what we collectively did. And that's 
is a very important thing, and I think all the crew members feel that way. It was a group effort mm -hmm. that no one person made it happen. You know, it all was pulling together, and where one person felt he was he was lacking, somebody would jump in to help. You know, I think, I think this expedition opens up a lot of questions. Um, it, it, it answers a lot of questions. It, it brings a lot of the history. I think it opens up a lot of questions of what not only the cell but other exploration has done for, the, for this country and to this country. Um, the, uh, the colonization that happened, the, you know, the impacts environmentally, the impacts culturally and socially on people that were here, uh, people that came. Um, I think that um, it doesn't answer those questions. We weren't set out, setting out to answer those questions when we left. But I think on the next expedition that somebody does, LaSalle Expedition 3, I think that would be an interesting, <laughs> those would be interesting uh, avenues to pursue on, uh, uh, of answering those types of questions, of the impacts that were had. You know, I would like to thank Rich. I mean, his knowledge of LaSalle and that period is just mind-boggling. Now, like he said, I wish we had to have Rich of today before we <laughs> began the expedition, but we were all learning. Mm -hmm. But what he, he, Rich has written papers for universities, I mean, the, and, and he's also debunked a lot of things about LaSalle written in books and all, things that he can prove are just not true because he has taken the time to go and find correspondence and all, you know, some really reliable sources, but uh, chapeau. <laughs> well, I, but thank you, Reed, for, for giving us the opportunity I mean, if, yes. you, you had to have, if you had to have had this dream and provided just the opportunity for us to, to really go out and excel and work hard and, and accomplish this, uh, none of us would know each other. We wouldn't have done the expedition. So thank you for the, for the vision, for, for, for the chance, the opportunity. Yes. Thank you, know, you Buzz. People have asked me, why, why was LaSalle so important? Of course, in Chicago, LaSalle's a big, a big name. Because LaSalle was through Illinois, and his, his center of his enterprise was here, and people in, in Midwest, a lot of people understand what LaSalle was, but they don't really understand the importance of what he did. What was the importance of what LaSalle did? And the answer is, the Louisiana Purchase. It's one third of our country. That's what the legacy of LaSalle was. Louisiana Purchase is a direct derivative of LaSalle's exploration. That's why it's so important to our nation. That's why it's so important to history. And fortunately, I've, I've had the opportunity to participate in the expedition, and that really just awakened my, my desire and my love of history and my desire to tell the story right, to tell the right story, to tell the story as it most actually occurred. So that's what I've spent the last four years doing, but it's only because I was given the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, um, the expedition that we did lit a fire in me and brought me a lot of hope. Um, and again, that's because you believed in the young people that we could do this as a team. No matter how hard it was and the things we went through, you believed that we could do it and we did it. And that makes me very filled with hope about all the generations that come after us and all that they can accomplish. Um, it was a grand adventure, and it's not done. Look at all the friendships we have. And it took us a while, you know, we, we had to get our families underway and, and our, our kids off to college before we realized, wait a minute, what about my LaSalle family? Yeah. And we started coming back together, and now we really try to reunite every couple of years and every five years a big event um, so that we see each other before we lose one another. So I, I just thank you so much. It has changed my life, and who I am is a, a, in large part because of this experience. It gave me confidence, it gives me hope, and just 
a lot of joy. A lot of joy. Thank you. And you know, all of us, if we can keep spreading the story to younger people, mm -hmm. don't let anybody tell you you can't. Right. And then tell about the expedition. So I say that is a good spot to end on for today. I want to thank all of you for being here today, both uh, virtually and in person. You know, I'd also like to thank uh, the Illinois Humanities for giving us the Activate History Grant to be able to put on this program. I'd like to thank uh, Beacon Academy for the audio and visual equipment from Ben Erickson and his team of students. Yeah, I appreciate that, guys. Yeah, I also like to thank uh, Bruce Shippier for for allowing the use of his recording studio for the intro, and Jeff Myers for his advice and input, uh, and direct and director of the museum, Sherry Blazer, and the Elgin Public Museum Board of Directors. Thank you. Everybody. And I would like to thank all of the expedition crew members for giving up a huge part of their lives to do this, and, and with the liaison team, I'll tell you, what you guys did is... <laughs> well, thank you for the vision, Reed. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Reed. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, that is LaSalle 2, Expedition 2, re explorer for you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Merci beaucoup à tous. In 1679, the French explorer La Salle set out from Montreal in search of the mouth of the Mississippi River. Enduring many hardships, in 1682, La Salle reached the Gulf of Mexico, claiming the land he'd explored for king and country. In celebration of the American Bicentennial in 1976, 23 Elgin area men, led by Larkin High School French teacher Reed Lewis, set off from Montreal in canoes with the goal of educating the public on French history in North America. Some of them have reunited here today to reflect on the experience in this program made possible by an Illinois Humanities Activate History Grant. Now live, the Elgin Public Museum of Natural History and Anthropology in Lord's Park presents La Salle Expedition 2, re-explored at 45.